we need to talk. We need to talk about a really important topic, one that plays a major role in getting the best photos you can and can even influence your next camera purchase. What I in fact talked about is image scale and this basically means how much sky fits onto a camera pixel. It determines how good your guiding needs to be, how sharp your stars are going to look and influences overall image quality. So with that said, here are five things that you need to know about image scale and I even brought a friend along. Okay, let's get started with sensor size. And with this, I mean actual sensor size. It's important for understanding image scale because as you can imagine, a big sensor and a small sensor behave differently. For telescopes, the difference in sensor size means a difference in the field of view. So basically what the camera can see. A large sensor effectively sees more and a smaller sensor sees less. Sensor size works alongside with focal length, which we'll talk about in a bit. But basically the two tell you how much space you're going to see in your camera. An easier way of thinking about this is more zoom, the amount of zoom that you're going to get, the amount of magnification almost. I, I'm a bit wary about saying that because I don't think it's completely accurate, but that's the best example I can give. A larger sensor sees more of the imaging circle. The imaging circle is basically where all the light from the telescope is being focused to. So a larger sensor naturally sees more and a smaller sensor naturally sees less. And because it doesn't see as much, it has a more zoomed in appearance. So to demonstrate, let's hop into Stellarium and I'm going to show you. Here's the same target with the same telescope. The Canon 600D has a larger sensor than the ASI 183MC Pro. Look at the change of field of view when you swap cameras. Basically, it's more zoom. Also, the sensor size dictates how many pixels you have and what megapixel your camera is. The pixel size is important for image scale. And to talk about that, I'm gonna hand you over now to Aaron Valiant of AV Astronomy to explain. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about pixel size, guys, and how that impacts your image scale. Um, generally speaking, the wider the angle the wider the field of view that you are imaging, say like nebulas, um, the Andromeda galaxy, um, even the Milky Way, our own galaxy, the wider the, the field of view, the smaller the pixels that you can get away with, okay? Um, and generally speaking, the shorter the field of view, the longer the focal length, the larger your pixels need to be, okay? And so what I'm going to do here is show you a little graph that I put together um, that gives you a visual of what I'm talking about and how this how this impacts uh, how much light is gathered and, and why that's useful. So let's take a look at this graph here I created for you. Okay, so here's a little graph that hopefully better illustrates what I'm talking about when I'm talking about pixel size and why that matters, especially in regard to focal length. So as you can see here, uh, pixels that are 2.4 microns in size, and this is typical of like the QHY183C, is not going to be able to gather quite as much light per pixel as, say, like the SBIG um, ST8300, which has a 5.4 micron pixel. And then, of course, you take that a step further, you look at the 9 micron pixel. So you can see here, each pixel, as the, the larger they get, the more capable they are of gathering more light per pixel. And so what that means to you is quicker imaging time, better sensitivity, but it also is an important piece in matching up focal length with pixel size so that you have the right image scale, that sweet spot of one arc second per pixel. All right, thanks buddy. I'm not gonna to talk to you about focal length. And I touched on this briefly when I was talking about sensor size, but focal length is one of the biggest factors in your image scale. Your image scale is directly affected by your focal length. And when you know what your focal length and your pixel size is, it also gives you a really good idea of how suitable a camera and telescope combination is. Focal length is basically how wide or how deep your view of the universe is. A shorter focal length, say three to 400 millimeters, lets you see more sky than 
thousand millimeters would. So you can see and capture much bigger targets with wider telescopes, and you can capture smaller targets with longer telescopes. Or even 2,700 millimeter telescopes like the SkyMax 180, which are ace for planets. Basically, think of it as trying to see a bit of grass 100 meters away. The grass is there and you can see a lot of it, but it's really small. Now, if you get closer and narrow your field of view towards that bit blade of grass, you're effectively extending your focal length and now you can see that grass. And how this also now ties into image scale is when you're wide, right, you can, the effects of wind isn't as prominent on that blade of grass, but the closer you get to it, the bigger that grass gets, you see the wind blowing a little more. This is the same as when you're wider, your guiding and tracking doesn't have to be as exact as when you're closer into something. The deeper you get to your target, the more exact your tracking and guiding has to be. Now this is just a general rule of thumb, but when you're using wide telescopes, you want to use smaller pixels to pick up more of that detail. When you're zoomed in more with a longer focal length instrument, the target is much bigger and you want to use bigger pixels to capture all that. Making sure that your camera and your telescope are singing from the same page helps reduce strain on your tracking and guiding systems. This also helps reduce your RMS error. And to explain RMS error to you, I'm going to hand you back over to Aaron while I finish my tea and maybe have some cake. I have no cake. Hey Ruse, yeah, some tea and cake sounds really good right about now. Well guys, let's talk about RMS. What is this RMS business? You've heard me mention it, I think. I'm sure you've heard me mention it before in other videos that I've posted. You know, I'll throw out numbers like 0.55 or 1, you know, arc second per pixel. So let's talk a little bit more about what RMS is. Simply put, RMS is the distance that the mount moves in right ascension or declination, okay, when guiding. In a nutshell, that's what that's referring to. And you want to minimize that distance as much as possible. And you do that, of course, using guiding software like PHD2. But to get a better understanding, uh, let's take a look at this graph right here so you can get a visual of what I'm talking about with regard to RMS. All right, so let's take a look at this graph here, guys. So in this particular example, you can see that the total RMS, and this is pretty darn good, is 0.54 arc seconds. So what that means here, and green represents declination, red represents right ascension. Those are the two different uh, motions of direction that the mount can move and as you can see here the biggest spike distance from here at this point is you know minus one arc second up to here is probably about 0.25 so you've got you know you've got a distance of like 0.8 something like that but it averages out the movements over a period of time and that's how you get what your average rms is uh, this shows you what your RMS is in right ascension and declination. But to put it simply, you want this number as low as possible. Um, now, in most imaging conditions, when you're shooting, say, in average seeing conditions, you're, for average seeing, you know, that's two to four arc seconds per pixel. Uh, the goal is to get somewhere between one and two arc, arcs, one and two arc seconds per pixel for your image scale, okay? That's what you're shooting for in those scene conditions. And, you know, if you get better than that, that's great. So, I mean, you you certainly, you know, it's okay to go better than that. It just means your guiding is that much tighter, but when you get above those numbers that are recommended, the one arc second is really kind of like the golden number. Um, that's when you start running into issues with, you know, stars bloating and maybe not getting quite as sharp of an image as you can. You start to lose some resolution there. So that's that's where RMS plays such an important role in getting a nice, clean, sharp image. Okay, the last thing that affects image scale is called binning. You may have heard of this. Such an original joke. And I couldn't help myself with that. 
The long and short of it is this. Binning basically combines one pixel with its neighbors to make one bigger pixel. Mighty Morphin Power Ranger style. Moving, moving on from that slightly dated reference and not wanting to get too nerdy with you, binned pixels add their values together. This value is then read out by the camera sensor's processor. And this one big pixel is what's known as a super pixel. A common bin is two by two. So this means that two pixels by two pixels work together. Remember how Aaron was talking to you about pixel size? So in the 183 sensor, which has 2.4 micron pixels, binning two by two gives you 4.8 micron pixels or 7.2 if you bin three by three. So why use binning? As mentioned throughout this video, focal length and pixel size give you image scale. So if you are zooming in more, if you're using a longer focal length than your camera is suitable for, you can somewhat overcome this by binning. I say somewhat because it has drawbacks. Think about it. If you're combining pixels into one super pixel, you're reducing the overall amount of pixels usable. A two by two bin actually quarters your image resolution. And binning can't be used with a one shot color camera to output a color photo. That's because all the pixels being combined together has messed up the bear matrix. And it'll output a grayscale image because that information cannot be debated. It doesn't know what pixel is assigned to what color anymore. The main takeaways of this video are this. Wider telescopes benefit more from smaller pixels and longer or deeper telescopes can take advantage of bigger pixels. Your focal length directly impacts your image scale and it also dictates how good your guiding needs to be. Sensor size has a direct effect on your field of view. A smaller sensor sees less and a tighter field of view, whilst a bigger sensor has a wider field of view. Binning can help but isn't perfect and has its drawbacks. And RMS error is the distance between peaks on your guiding graph and getting this number below your image scale helps keep your images sharp. Lucky for us, there's this wonderful tool called the CCD Image Suitability Calculator from Astronomy Tools. It's linked in the description below. But what you do in this is you input your telescope information, you input your camera information, and not only will it tell you whether or not you are under or over or well sampled, you see that little image scale number there? If you can get your tracking or your guiding numbers below this one, you're good to go. Be sure to check out Aaron's channel, AV Astronomy. It's linked in the description below. He's doing some great work over there and this video would not have been possible without him. So thank you very much, Aaron, for working with me. And with that, that have been five things that you need to know about image scale. We hope you've learned something and hope you can go forward now more informed than before. If you didn't like this video, well, you know what to do. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more content like this. And if you have any questions about image scale that we've talked about, feel free to drop us a comment. And with that, it's time to say clear skies, everybody. Keep looking up and keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.